<clears throat> um, any problems, concerns we need to deal with? Before we start reviewing for exam five on chapter seven. Nope, good to go, all right. <clears throat> well, in that case, I should have some, oops, got to turn it on first, there it goes. There they are. Let's start off with number two. Now, to be sure, nobody has any specific questions on these reviews. Okay. And I want to get those done before we do anything else so that we don't miss anybody's uh, sticking points. <clears throat> All right. In that case, number two. Which form of electromagnetic radiation has the longest wavelength? The longest wavelength out of these gamma, microwave, radio, infrared, x rays. So, <clears throat> the best way to approach a question like this is uh, energy. Which one has the greatest energy would have the shortest wavelength? Which one would have the least energy would have the longest wavelength. Um, and that goes back to Planck's equation, right? Like that, or like actually better like this. <clears throat> so notice that the, the higher energy is the one with the smallest wavelength, right? It's in the denominator, it has to be that way. So which one has the, sh the uh, longest wavelength? Well, the least energetic, right? You're talking about the past the red end of the spectrum, way out on, ra on the radio end, right? So radio waves out of that group have the longest wavelength. They have the, the least, they're the least energetic, okay? Yeah, I'll go ahead and erase it. Number three. <clears throat> Which of the following frequencies correspond to light with the longest wavelength? Well, maybe I should have left that up there. We're talking now about this equation, right? Frequency wavelength. So if the longest wavelength you want, this gets longer, this gets smaller. So the frequency has to be the smallest number, All right? So the smallest one out of that group, I'd look at the, uh, I'd look at the powers of 10 first, right? That could, that could be all you need to know, right? So here is the smallest frequency right there. If I were snaky and put two in there with the same wavelength, then you'd go to this one for a tiebreaker. So that's why B is the answer. All right. Let's see if we can keep moving along here. Number six. A line in the spectrum of atomic mercury has a wavelength of 254 nanometers. Nanometers. One of Mercury's um, lines. <clears throat> Remember when we talked about hydrogen having a line spectrum of only four lines and four visible lines? <clears throat> All elements are that way. All elements have line spectra. Some of them are more complex than the others. And if you've got more than one element mixed together and you're trying to separate them, then you want to pick one where the lines are unique so that you don't get them mixed up speaking from the from the uh, standpoint of someone who's analyzed thousands of samples that way okay so uh wavelength is 254 nanometers when mercury emits a photon of light at this wavelength the frequency of this light is okay in that case 
you're associating wavelength with frequency, right? So you need this equation. <clears throat> but remember, we're in SI units here, right? This wavelength is going to be meters, and this frequency is going to be in reciprocal seconds. That wavelength is not in meters. So the best way to convert this to meters is to take this right here, that prefix. What does that mean? It means a billionth of nano, a billionth, 10 to the minus ninth. And there you have it. Now your calculator will do the conversion for you. You just put, punch in 254 exponent minus nine. And then what is this one? 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And if we solve for frequency, then wavelength becomes the denominator over here, right? It just comes over here. I'll leave it like it is. And then you check yourself. Is that going to give you frequency? Well, meters cancel, denominator, numerator. But this denominator is also here, so that's minus one. Yeah, that'll work. You just divide those two numbers. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to say the answer should be 1.18 times 10 to the 15 reciprocal seconds. Or what other unit? What's that equal to? Hertz. Right. In case I get sneaky and put Hertz in there instead of these, then you'll know the relationship. Okay. I might. I've been known to be sneaky. All right. That was six, eight. Green light can have a wavelength of 543 nanometers. Why do they say can have a wavelength of 543 nanometers? What is green? Green is what our brain interprets as light entering our eyes. When we see green, our brain interprets it as green. It doesn't say that green must be 543 nanometers. Click, 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 click. No, <laughs> it's green to us. But when you use an instrument, you shine that green light on your instrument, then it could be 543 or it could be 545 or it could be 540. Okay, so that's why they say can have a wavelength of 543 nanometers. And if you look at it, your brain's going to tell you it's green. But if it's 540, your brain might also tell you it's green. Or one might be forced green. One might be, I don't know, what's another green? Emerald, Emerald green? Yeah, okay, that's a good one. <clears throat> what's the energy of a photon of light? Okay, we're back to this equation, Planck's equation. Only we've got wavelength in there, right? So we need this one. All right. And we're, we're at the same place here as we were before. This has to be in meters. So that would be 543 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And this would be uh, 2.9979 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And Planck's constant is in the useful information. Go to the back and look for H. Six point six two six times ten to the minus thirty four joules seconds. Right. Then you have C right here. This one right here goes there, and this one right here goes there. Okay. Then you should do the math. Right. The meters are going to cancel because that's meters on top, and this will be meters on the bottom. This will be seconds on the bottom. This will be seconds on the top. This is a numerator. Seconds cancel, seconds, meters cancel, meters. You're left with joules. 
units agree that you put everything in the right place. And it should come out um, 3.66 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's how many in, how much energy is in that wavelength, that photon. Okay. All right, number eight. Let's see, I need to scroll this one a little bit. Oops, it's off the edge. I can't do it that way. Oops. Okay. So I need to do it the old fashioned way. Can be more eventually. We'll get this one out of the way and then we can go to the next one. <clears throat> okay, number 11. How many of the following statements is are correct? So that means one of them could be correct, or it could be all of them could be correct. Uh, I, the importance of the equation e equals mc squared. E equals mc squared is that mass and that energy has mass. Is that true? I have to go dig up Einstein and ask him. No, he put it in his publications. Energy is equal to mass with square of the speed of light as the constant value, the conversion factor. So, yes, that is true. How about this one? Electromagnetic radiation can be thought of as a beam of particles called photons. Is that one true? Yeah, in fact, light. Sometimes it's particles and sometimes it's waves. And Einstein says sometimes it's both. So that was true. But this one, electromagnetic radiation exhibits wave properties. Well, we just answered that one. And IV, energy can only occur in discrete units called quanta. Yes, that is true. Energy is quantized. Um, evidence of that, line spectra in atomic, in atomic spectra makes only lines. Um, this equation. Planck's equation assumes quantization of energy. Right. That packet equals that much energy. Okay, oh, so they're all true. E is the answer. All right, let's see if I can get this next. We're gonna get two of them, maybe. We're gonna need that top one anyway. Um, no, I cut off too much. From the following list of observations, choose the one that most clearly supports the conclusion. And this is for the following four questions. So if number 12 says electrons have wave properties, well, if electrons have wave properties, which observation supports that? And it looks like it's it's only one because we don't have any combinations in here. So let's see, emission spectrum of hydrogen. No, nah, that's not waves. Elect a photoelectric effect. No, sorry. <laughs> Scattering of alpha particles by metal foil. Um, that's just thrown in there to confuse you. Right? We, didn't, we haven't talked about that since um, the gold foil experiment. Diffraction. Ah, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> diffraction. What's diffraction? If light is a particle only for nothing else, then when light comes in contact with this uh, slit, these are blocked and this will go straight through. It makes a bright spot right there. That's it. That's the only place that you would see light. 
if it were particles only. But what we actually see is light as a wave, and you can draw it like this, or you can draw it like that, it doesn't matter. When it strikes that slit, that slit serves as a point source for a new wave. So when you have your detectors out here, you will have a bright spot there, but you'll also have uh, gradients of light away from it. Okay, so 12 is uh, D, diffraction. What's a cathode ray? It's kind of hard to describe that to, to my students now because uh, have any of you ever used a, a TV that's that's big picture tube? You know, the heavy, bulky things that are that deep? You have? Okay, so you know what a cathode, cathode ray tube is. That's what they use for those old picture tubes. Uh, computer monitors used to be that way too, before the flat screens. Um, but a cathode ray is just a stream of electrons. And electrons are particles, but electrons are also waves. That's why the electron microscope works, because you can focus those waves with electromagnetic, uh, with magnetic energy. Okay, uh, 13. Oops, I'm gonna have to scroll. Electromagnetic radiation has wave characteristics. Wait a minute. You guys let me get away with another one. Electrons have wave properties. Okay, so the last statement that I gave you about electron microscope, that's diffraction. Electrons will diffract, just like light. Electromagnetic radiation has wave characteristics for the same reason, diffraction. Uh, how about let's see, let's see that? How about 14? Electrons in atoms have quantized energies. Oh, I'm gonna have to go back because we need to look at our choices. Electrons in atoms have quantized energy. Okay, which one of those best describes quantization of energy? This would be 14. What do you think? Well, I think emission spectrum of hydrogen supports that the best. Because right? you can't get anything in between. You can only get those lines. Specific frequencies, wavelengths of energy emitted by a transition of electron Right, between different levels. Let's say it's go up here again. It's like that. And it will emit a photon of light. It can't go anywhere in between. That's, that's the best explanation for why you get line spectra is the quantization of electrons in an atom. So that would be A. Yes. And the fourth one is supposed to be based on that also. Spacing between atoms in a crystal is on the same order as the de Broglie wavelength of accelerated electrons. The same wavelength as accelerated electrons. We haven't talked much about that. In fact, we won't uh, talk about the, the, that wavelength problem until next semester when we talk about X ray diffraction. But um, it's like I just said, diffraction, <laughs> X-ray diffraction. That's the pos That's the prop. The process that gives rise to um, detecting the spacing between atoms in a crystal. Okay, I forgot to. Silence my phone. Let's see. There we go. <clears throat> so 
So we got two diffractions and a, a line spectrum for those first for those four problems. Okay, the four lines observed in the visible emission spectrum of hydrogen tell us that what? The hydrogen molecules uh, came from having the form H4. No, that's ridiculous. We could observe we could observe more lines if we had a stronger prism. Now it's been tried. Experiments have been done with. With stronger diffraction, in fact, in fact, uh, double diffraction. They'll take one prism, spread the lines out, and they'll take a second prism and set it in front of one of those lines and try to spread it again. Never happens. They even did third and fourth prisms just to be sure. Right, so B is not the answer. There are four electrons in an excited hydrogen atom. <laughs> that would be a neat trick, right? They have a minus three charge. No, only certain energies are allowed for the electron in a hydrogen atom. That's the key. Only certain energy levels are allowed. I get the feeling I'm, I'm beating that horse too much, so let's move on. For which of the following transitions does light emitted have the longest wavelength? Okay, these are the energy levels, right? Based on Bohr's model and the principal quantum number too. So which would have the longest wavelength? Like before, the one with the least energy. So how do you get the least energy out of an electron jump in an atom? It jumps the least distance, right? It might go just one level, like uh, four to three, that's a possibility. Four to three is a single level. Four to two, four to one, that's out. Those are higher energy because they're making bigger jumps. How about three to two? That's a single jump, right? Or two to one, okay? Those are single jumps. Now you have to ask yourself, which one jumps the farthest? All right? And if you look at our model of the atom, you have a level one, a level two, a three, a four, Five, one, two, three. We only need four. So if it goes from four to three, that's a pretty short jump. If it goes from three to two, that's a bigger jump. If it goes from two to one, that's a huge jump. So the longest wavelength, the lowest energy would be a four to three. Okay. All right. There's the, I see 18 peeking its head there. Let's see, like that. When a hydrogen electron makes a transition from three to one, okay, which of the following statements is true? Energy is emitted, energy is absorbed, the electron loses energy, the electron gains energy, the electron cannot make this transition. We throw five out. We know that happens. So it's one, two, three, or four, or a combination. Well, we've already thrown out five, so it can't be this one. That means it has to be two of the above. Two of them have to be true in order to satisfy the conditions of this multiple choice question. All right, so uh, when it goes from three to one, it's going from a higher level to a lower level, right? That means it emits energy. Right. So energy is emitted. Yep. It can be Roman numeral one. Energy is absorbed. Can't have both. Uh, the electron loses energy. Yep. It's higher energy here, lower energy there. So it loses energy. Right. Roman numeral one and three. That's B. Okay. All righty, let's see, 21, you 21 here, or I have to intervene. Which of the following is incorrect? Right. Pay close attention to these questions. 
Some say correct, some say incorrect, some say true, some say not true. Um, which is incorrect. The emission spectrum of hydrogen contains a continuum of colors. Right? A is false. Right? Now, if you're pressed for time and you're in the middle of a test and you look down here and you see, right? These are unique answers. Every one of them. When you find the right answer, put it down and go get the next one. Right, so all the rest of these should be true. Diffraction produces both constructive and destructive interference. We haven't talked about interference yet. Okay. Um, we could if we had time. Right. Destructive interference is like, I'll, I'll do a quick version. You have two slits here. And your light beam comes along here and strikes those slits. Right, you got two point sources here. They go like that, like that, like that, like that, like that. Right, we keep doing that, like point sources for that wave now. Well, wherever, and these are considered high points right, on the wave. Right, high um, crests and troughs. If you meet two crests, you get uh, an added amount like that. If you meet two troughs, then you get a depressed amount. That's destructive interference. Constructive interference is when the two if this one right here is a is a crest and it meets a trough, they cancel each other out. That's destructive interference. Um, I think it's next semester you get a bigger dose of that. I'm pretty sure. Let's see. Uh, no, no, I think we're going to get to it maybe in chapter eight or nine. Yeah, yeah, we are going to talk about that again. Uh, so 21 is A. 22. Which of the following statements best describes the Heisenberg unpredictability <laughs> principle? What is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Right. I wrote a formula on the board, but I, I'm not expecting you to remember that. Just remember that. This is the simplest way to put it. When particles are really small, subatomic particles, you can't know both where they are and how fast they're going at the same time. If you know either one of those with accuracy, then the other one becomes completely unknowable. So let's see. The exact position of electron is always uncertain. No. You can find out where it is. You just won't know how fast it's going or how much energy it has. The velocity of a particle can only be estimated. Well, you can you can fix the velocity too, but if you do, you won't know where it is. That seems weird. Right? How do you tell how fast something is going if you don't know where it is? <clears throat> it's impossible to accurately know both exact location and momentum of a particle. Momentum has within it the velocity factor, right? Momentum is mass times velocity. And if you're talking about a particle like an electron or a proton or some other subatomic particle, the mass doesn't change during the process of whatever you're doing. So you can say that's a constant. Now you're focused on the velocity. So C is the answer, right? And like our test taking technique, um, we don't need to look at the rest of them because we found the right answer. Okay, after 22, let's see, 25. Okay. We're in the realm of what now? Electronic configurations. Right. How we're building atoms again. So how many F orbitals have the value N equals three? So you got F orbital with N equals three. Remember how they go. You got N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. Right. So N equals three in this case. What are the possibilities for L? Right. I'm going to get it right this time. Not the way I did it in lecture. 
start with zero and go up to n minus one. Okay. So these are the possibilities for n. But we're focused on which one. This is an S, this is a P, and this is a D. There are no Fs, right? It's a trick question. It cannot have any Fs. So the answer is A, zero. No F orbitals in N equals three. You gotta go to N equals four before you can get Fs. All right? So let me scroll and pick up how many? Let me pick up three. That one. Okay. So we got some more. Maybe I should leave that there. Just change the number. Uh, L, M sub L, and M sub S, right? Okay, 26. Now we're looking at how many f orbitals um, can you have in n equals 6. Right? So we could have a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, this is S, P, D, F. Yep. Um, so here we have F at three. So how many orbitals can this have? Right, this is a shell. Remember the, the verbiage that's used in a lot of textbooks. This is the cell shell, this is a subshell, and this is an orbital. So the M sub Ls are considered orbitals. That's what we're getting at, All right? So if we have uh, three, here, this could be what? Minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. All right? So, how many of those are there? So, six, seven, seven, seven. You can have seven orbitals. Now, you can either go through this process of uh, working your way down. <coughs> Or you can memorize the answers. Okay. All Fs have seven orbitals. All Ds have how many? Five. Okay. All Ps have how many? Three. All Ss have how many? Just one. Yep. And we didn't go beyond F. We don't need to. You could if you wanted to. I mean, Four would give you two more on either end, right? So that'd be nine if you went to G's. Oops, I'm about to do it again. M sub L. Okay, so that's 26 is uh, B, seven. 27, uh, if N equals two, N equals two, how many orbitals are possible? Right now, we're going to add up all possibilities. Not just for one of the subshells, but for all, everything under n equals two. So, how many of these can we have? Just that many, right? right zero and one, zero and minus one. So, we can have one for this one. We have, this one could give us uh, a zero. This one could give us how many? Minus one, zero, plus one. So we can have four. Right? Four. Here. Okay. Why do we have zero twice? Oh, because it's a different suborbital. This suborbital S can give us, subshell can give us one orbital. The S can give us only one orbital. Uh, because it's minus zero, zero, and plus zero, <laughs> to be facetious. And then the one is another possibility from n equals two, right? So one equals minus one, zero, and plus one possibility. And just add them up. Okay? 
<laughs> All right, that was 27, which should be B. Uh, 28. A given set of P orbitals consists of how many orbitals? Oh, we just did that. Right? How many can you have in a P? Three. X, Y, and Z. All right, let's see. I'm going to have to scroll again, I think. Okay, so let's go to 29. Which of the following is an incorrect designation for an atomic orbital? Okay. So let's see. We got these choices 1s, 3d. 1p, 4f, 6s. All right, I look at it this way. <clears throat> Since we're only using the shell and the subshell, um, look at the subshell first, right? Go in order, s, p, d, f. Right, so s's. Can you have s's for six? Yeah. Right, you go start off with S, P, D, F, G. No, you can do G, maybe even F, uh, H. Right, so S, that's good. How about this one? One S, right? Think hydrogen. That's good too. Okay, how about the P's? P's, can you have a P in an N equals one? Now, if N equals one, if N equals one, then L can only equal zero, and that's an S. No P's available, right? That was gone. Oh, we found our answer. So we have to assume, we don't have to assume, we know. Threes can have Ds and fours can have Fs, right? But ones cannot have P's. I mean, they can only have this much, right? Go one to uh, zero, start with zero, zero, Yeah, up to n minus one, right? This is equal to n minus one, so that's as high as you can go. Can't go up to one, right? Because the highest number has to be n minus one. All right, we found our answer. C. Let's see here. 31, yeah, I was afraid of that. Going to get them all. Yeah. 31. A point in the wave function where the amplitude is zero defines what? This just have to memorize this. What's that called? Where the amplitude is zero in the wave function. That's called a node. Right? That's a node. Probability of finding an electron in a node is. Zero. It could be there. Remember, we're talking about probabilities. It could be there, but the calculated probability is zero. So it's it's highly unlikely that you'll ever find an electron in a node. Thirty-two. How many electrons in an atom can have the quantum number? Quantum numbers in how many electrons? How many number of electrons that can have n equals three? Well, I got already got written over here. N equals three and L equals two. Okay. At this point, all you need to say is, is that possible? Yeah. All right. N minus one. So that's the highest number you can get for L. Now, how many electrons? Well, we have to go to M sub L from here. So two is minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. And then this can either be one half or uh, minus one half. So you can have two, right, one of each, two, four, six, eight, ten. Ten's your answer, C. Right. And I don't know if you remember, but 
This is a d orbital. And where on the, the periodic table are d orbitals being filled? Crickets. The transition metals. So you look at the transition metals, and how many do you have in a period in the transition? Exactly 10. You're filling d orbitals in the transitions. Okay. All right, let's see. Those there and go to 33. How many electrons can be described by the quantum numbers? Uh, N equals three, L equals three. Is that possible? N equals three, L equals three, M sub L equals one. How many electrons? Look, that's not possible. Right? It's too big. It has to be, it, the biggest it can be is two, right? So no electrons can have that number. That's why the answer is zero. Okay, another trick question, just to see if you're paying attention. All right, 34. What is the L quantum number for a 4S orbital? Okay, four, what's S? Zero, right? That's your answer. It asks you for the L number for S. And S's are always L equals zero. Okay. I didn't write the number up there. For the viewing audience, that was number 34. I think they're playing next door with the anatomage. An anatomy table where you can dissect a person virtually. Perform operations. It's pretty neat. Next, you want to take anatomy and physiology, then. Maybe not. <laughs> 37. Which of the following combinations of quantum numbers, N, L, N sub L, N sub S, do not represent permissible solutions of the Schrodinger equation? or the electron in the hydrogen atom, which combination is not allowed. So we've got the electron in the hydrogen atom, right? We've got one electron. Which of these is not allowed? All right, so we have to say, uh, let's do A, B, C, and D. First one is nine, eight, minus four, and plus one half. The second one is eight, two, two, and plus one half. The third one is six minus five, right? Yep, minus five, uh, minus one, and plus one half. And wait a minute, I skipped one. Six minus five, minus one, plus one half, okay. Six, five, minus five, and plus one half. Okay, which one of these is not allowed? Are all of them allowed? Well, let's see. If we find one that's not allowed, then E cannot be true. And then we have to find the one that is allowed, which would be only one of the, of the remaining ones. <clears throat> okay, is this possible? Well, let's see, nine, uh, eight. Can this be eight? Yeah, right, that's the n minus one. How about this one? Minus eight, minus seven, minus six, minus, minus four. Yeah, that's right, so this one's okay. Right, everybody follow that? I moved too fast. How about this one? Eight, can we have a two here? Well, yeah, zero, one, and two. So that's good. How about now, if we have two here, can this one be two? Right, minus two up to plus two. Yep, that one's good. How about this one? Six. And can this one be minus five? No, these are only positive numbers. 
zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So this one is wrong. All right. So we eliminated E and we found the one uh, which defined combinations do not represent. So this one does not represent. And since we eliminated E, we can stop there. Or we can check ourselves, right? N minus one, that's true. Minus five, yep. Minus five to plus five. Yep, that one's true. So C is the answer. That one's not permitted. Based upon that sign right there. You cannot have a negative as a, a L number. All right. Oops. I knew I was going to do that. Just couldn't stop myself. All right. Uh, 40. This looks like another memory. Who was the first chemist to recognize patterns and chemical properties of elements? Remember? The temptation is to say Mendeleev, but he wasn't the first. Mendeleev and Meyer were contemporaries, right? So they both recognized patterns at the same time. Anybody before them? Bohr didn't, Bohr wasn't concerned. He proposed the planetary model for the atom. And Newlands, I don't even know who that is. It's probably somebody famous, but I don't know him. The only one left is Doberheiner. I remember Doberheiner in his triads. He had three elements that formed, that had similar characteristics, he called them triads. That's Doberheiner. Sounds like a dog breed, doesn't it? It could have been from the same region, Dobermann, Doberreiner. I don't know German, so I can't tell you. Anybody study in German? No? Okay. That used to be when, you, if you were going to get a chemistry degree, you had to study German. Because there was a big swath of time in there when only the best publications in chemistry were in German journals. Now, before the U.S. kind of caught on. And now every journal has its English versions. And many of them have, well, their own native language plus English. And sometimes when they're in foreign languages, the abstract, you know what an abstract is in a publication? It's like a condensation of everything that's in the publication. You can read it and see if this worth going into in depth, or I mean, it's gonna help my program. Do I need it? And you read the abstract, and you say, nope, toss it. Okay, 41. <clears throat> Mendeleev is given the most credit for the concept of a periodic table of the elements because, before we even look at that, you should know the answer. He's given most credit because not only did he recognize patterns, he made predictions about missing elements based upon that information. So let's see which one fits. Uh, longest history, nope. Emphasized usefulness in predicting the existence of properties of unknown elements. There it is right there. B. Okay. Let's see, 44. Okay, we're going to get to write an electronic configuration for 10. What's the, what's the symbol for 10? It's one of those Latin funky ones. Not enough. <laughs> stanum. 10 is stanum. Now you need to go to your periodic table and say, all right, how many electrons does the neutral atom have? Well, let's see. 10 has... 50. 50 protons, 50 electrons in the neutral atom. So looks like we got to write the whole thing out. Okay. So let's see. 
Let's write out our um, orbital configuration first. 1s2, 2s2, 2p. Oops. I just told you I wasn't going to do that. 2p, 3s, 3p, um, 4s, and then 3d, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4s, and then uh, 4p, and then let's see, I'm going to look at periodic table 1, 2, 3, 4. 4P, 5S, 4D, 4D, uh, and then 5P. That may be enough. We'll pick up some others if we need them. Now, how did I know they were in this order? Well, either I have that uh, slant diagram memorized or I use the periodic table. And I just follow along and say, all right, who's next and which orbital is being filled? And it comes right off the periodic table in that order. Left to right, top to bottom. Okay, so this has how many? S's have two. Two. P's have how many? 33? 14? Seven. <laughs> Six. P's have three orbitals, two electrons each. S is two again, six, two. D's, remember how many D's can be? 10, uh-huh. So we got six and two. Let's see how many we got so far. All right, six and four is 10. And then four and six is another 10. And then another 10. And then we got eight. So that's 38. That means we've got 12 more to go, right? So this can have 10, right? So now we have two, two more to go, like that. Now, if I'm in a hurry, if I know this is right, right, I'm confident in the way I write my electronic configuration, I know that's right, then I would look down here and say, and just scan the right-hand side of each one. Let's see, A is a 5P, B is not, throw B out. C is a 5P and D is a 5P. All right. All right. Now back up. Four Ds. All right. A doesn't have a 4D next coming from right to left. All right. Throw A out. So A and B are gone. Um, C is gone. It's got a 5D and should be a 4D. D has a 4D. Process of elimination is D. Okay. Now, how would we write this in the abbreviated form? Go backwards until you find a noble gas. Right? So you look at your periodic table. Here's 10. Go backwards. Krypton is 36. All right? What do you have beyond Krypton? Well, let's see. 36 from 50 is what? 14. Okay, so two, I'm going to say. There you go. That's Krypton. Now you need is 5S2, 4D10, and 5P2. And that's the abbreviated form. Now, how many valence electrons are there in 10? That's not one of the questions. I'm just spitball. You look for the highest energy level, five. You got two there and two there, four valence electrons. Okay. Ten doesn't count. All right. And that's another reason that you're going to find that ten has predominantly two charges. That it will occupy either a plus two kick those two off or a plus four kick those two off also that's where the the plus two plus four selection of char charges comes from all right 44 
I'm gonna do it on time. It's already 1.30. When do I have to stop? 145? Yeah. I'm not gonna finish. So we'll just go as far as we can and go do our lab. I'll come back as usual and finish up. All right, 46. The statement that the lowest energy configuration for an atom is the one having the maximum number of unpaired electrons allowed by the Pauli exclusion principle in a particular set of degenerate orbitals is known as, we didn't define degenerate orbitals yet. Um, we can answer the question without knowing that, and I'll define them in a second. Okay, so which principle are we talking about? The lowest energy configuration is the one having the maximum number of unpaired electrons. Whose rule is that? Hund's, Hund's rule. The example I give you is like we have a 2P uh, for nitrogen, right? It'd be like this, this, and this. For oxygen, is one more electron. Now you can pair them up. Right? But nitrogen has to have one in each one of these before you can start pairing. That's Hund's rule. Uh, 47. An element has the electron configuration of krypton 5s2, 4d. We just did that one. What element is that? 10, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how can you find that? If we didn't do that other one first, how would you be able to do that? Go to Krypton, right? Then go back to the period below it and start adding electrons in, right? The next two are 5s because those are the uh, alkaline metals and alkaline earths are S, S1 and S2. And then you go to the right and say, okay, we've got to go all the way across the Ds, right, with 10. Now we're back into the Ps. And then you go two into the Ps. So on the periodic table, you go, right? You're over here like this. Now you're into the P's again. One, two. Has to be 10. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is say, how many electrons does Krypton have? Uh, 36. Add 12 to it. 50. Go look up 50. There's 10. Okay. So there's more than one way to uh, skin a possum. I don't skin cats or dogs. Okay, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. That wasn't even the question, was it? And you guys are going to just let me ramble on. <clears throat> okay, now that we know it's 10, I, I guess you do need to know it's 10 in order to answer this question. Which one of these is it? Non-metal transition, metal, lanthanide, actinide. Right. And you look over there, where is 10? Right. 10 is here. It's a metal. Right. It's below this zigzag line. So it'd be C, metal. I could be sneaky and put metalloid in there. Right. It's right next to the line. Oh, no, it's not. Not close enough. Metalloid would be these two, these two, and this one. Right. It wouldn't be a metalloid. Then there would be no answer. <laughs> 48. All right. 48. An element with the electron configuration xenon 6s2, 4f14, 5d7 would belong to which class on the periodic table? Okay. All right, to answer this one, actually, you don't have to know the element. You say, which is being filled? 5D, right? 5D is being filled. So you go over here and say, all right, which one's, which one of the D's being filled? Transition metals, right? So it has to be transition metal. 
you know the one that's being filled because it's the farthest one to the right. If it's a D, it's a transition metal. So that's A. How about 49? All alkaline earths have the following number of valence electrons. Right? You ought to just spit that one out. It's in the second column. It has S orbitals being filled. It has two electrons in the S orbitals, highest level. It has two electrons right there. That's why we learned that everybody in that, in that second group, when it's in an ionic compound, always makes a plus two charge. So when you name them, it's a class one or type one compound. It only has one possible charge. Now we're seeing why that is. Before we just had learning. 15. Okay, 50. What is that? TI. Nobody? Titanium. Yeah, titanium. Has, has so many electrons, so many electrons in its d orbitals. All you have to do is say, find titanium on the periodic table and ask yourself, is it filling d orbitals at the time? It's a transition metal, right? It's right over there. How many over does it fail? Well, these are S's. That's one, two. That's two d orbital electrons. Right there. <clears throat> All right. Was I supposed to do that one? Yeah. Okay. Iron has how many electrons that are unpaired in its d orbitals? Let's see. We need to spend some time on this one. Iron. So iron has 26. Right? So if we're only looking for the uh, highest level D orbital, which is, it's a transition metal, so it'll have Ds. Which D is it in? And how many electrons are left over? Well, actually, we're on uh, the fourth period, which means these are three Ds, right? Fourth period, Ds have to be threes, three Ds. Okay. How many over is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six electrons in the D orbital. Okay. How many sublevels are in Ds? Let's see, zero. S, P, D, three. So it has five sublevels. Right? Two, four, six, eight, ten. That gives you ten electrons in the Ds. Okay, so get six. So we can go one, two, three, four, five, six. So how many unpaired electrons do you have? Four. Okay. Took a little detective work. Exercise some brain cells. Let's see. About five minutes left. Let's see what I can do in five minutes. Um, okay, 53. Which represents the ground state for nitrogen out of these configurations? I, I just showed you nitrogen a minute ago. But if I hadn't done that, look at nitrogen. Where is it? Which orbitals are being filled? Well, it's already passed the, the uh, two S's. Now it's in the two P's. So it's got a two S2 and a two P what? Well, you had to get to one S to go by that, right? So that's nitrogen. How many electrons in nitrogen? Seven. Right, so two, four, we need three more. Okay, what's the proper configuration though? They left out the one S there, notice that. Proper configuration would be two here, right? And then over here, 
you got three. One, two, three. So two and then three unpaired. That would be A. I'm putting you to sleep? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, 54. Which represents the ground state for N minus one? Oh, yeah, 54. Let's do it again. 54. N minus one. So you start with seven protons and you're adding an electron. So how many electrons do you have? Eight electrons. And so here we have, uh, we'll skip the one S. Two S, two P, here, 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 here. And two there, one, two, three. That's the neutral atom. We added an electron like that. So it'll be, this one will be full. There it is right there. This is full. And this one has two paired and two unpaired. See how I did that? Thinking about it. Just add an extra electron. When you're, when you're doing ions, always start with a neutral atom. And then if it goes positive, you take away an electron. If it goes too positive, take away two electrons. If it goes negative, add an electron, or two, or three, however many you need, okay? All right. We're 55. Am I gonna to need to talk about introductory remarks about the lab today? We can do them in the lab. Were there, I didn't check. Are there some pre-lab questions? Okay, we'll do those. In which group do all the elements have the same number of valence electrons? Okay, how do we answer this one? First of all, uh, if they're gonna have the same number of valence electrons, they have to be in the same family. They have to be the same group. That's the first condition, right? Phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, those are not the same group, right? They're in the same period, not the same group. So they won't have the same number of valence electrons. So you can throw A out. How about silver, cadmium, and argon? Well, ar <laughs> argon's a noble gas, so you know that these guys don't match. How about sodium, calcium, and barium? Well, calcium and barium are in the same family, but sodium's not, right? You can just look at the periodic table. Uh, phosphorus, arsenic, and selenium. Well, phosphorus and arsenic are together, but selenium's not. So none of them, none of them have the same valence electrons, right? Because they're not all three in the same group. All right, two minutes. Of the following elements, which has occupied d orbitals in its ground state neutral atom? Occupied d orbitals. Right. So for 58, how do you answer that one? What elements are being constructed with d orbitals? Transition elements. So you look for any of these that are transitions. Which has occupied d orbitals in its ground state neutral atom. Oh, all right, that's a tricky question. Just which ones have occupied d orbitals? Right. So we don't have to be filling them at the time, but do they have occupied d orbitals? Right. Look at barium, all right, where's barium? Barium is down here. If you go backwards and backwards and backwards, yep, it's got d orbitals. Right. Calcium, where's calcium? Uh, here, calcium, go backwards. Calcium, nope, calcium has no d orbitals. Silicon, silicon's up here. Nope, no d orbitals for silicon. I'm just going backwards until I find d's. Phosphorus, there, nope, no d orbitals there. Chlorine, nope, no d orbitals. The only one that has d orbitals is barium that are occupied. We're not actually filling them, right? It's not a transition metal, but the d orbitals are occupied in its core. 
core electrons uh, contain d orbitals. Okay, I guess we'll stop there and I'll come back. All right, number 59. Of the following elements, which needs three electrons to complete its valence shell? All right, think about that. If it's if it needs to complete a valence shell, and it needs three electrons, which orbits would that possibly re reveal? Right, S and P predominantly. Right, so S can have two, P can have six. So it's, if it's going to have three needed to complete, the, it's either got one over here, or it's got three over here right, to complete the valence shell. So let's look at each one. Uh, that might be a little too uh, difficult to follow. So let's look at the, the possibilities. A, B, C, D, and E. All right, you got barium, calcium, silicon, phosphorus, and chlorine. All right, what do their valence shells look like? Barium is uh one two three four five six s with two electrons in that means in order to complete its valence shells it's got a 5d in here but that's got to be complete before you can get to 6p right it's the highest number right so how many does it need Right, it would need six to complete its valence shell. Right, so it can't be it can't be barium. Calcium, calcium is the same as barium. Right, only it's four uh, s two, and now it's going for four p six. It needs six to complete its valence shell, and in here we would have three d ten. Silicon, uh, silicon is one two three p two. 3P2, 3S2. Right, 3P2. So this one needs four more to complete its shell. Right, so it can't be silicon. How about phosphorus? Phosphorus is in the third period. So it's 3P3, 3P3, and it's got 3S2. How many does it need to complete, right? Three more electrons would complete that shell. That's your answer. Chlorine we know is not right because it's right next to the noble gases and it only needs one electron to complete its valence shell. So we found our answer right here, phosphorus. Phosphorus needs three electrons to complete its valence shell. All right, let's see, where's my pointer? I'll go ahead and scroll since I'm over here. 62. All right. <clears throat> Which of the following atoms has three electrons in p orbitals in its valence shell? Three electrons in p orbitals out of barium, gallium, vanadium, bismuth, or none of these. Okay. Barium, we already looked at. In its p orbitals, barium has, has nothing. I mean, it's. Its p orbitals are all full, and it's got one. After you get past uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
after you get past 6S and 5D, then you've got 6P, but it's got nothing in it. Right? So it needs all six to complete this P. Can't be that one. How about gallium? Gallium has a one, two, three, four, four P, four P one. It needs five electrons to complete its valence shell, right? So it can't be gallium. Vanadium. Vanadium has uh, one, two, three, four, four S two, and three D three, right? So <laughs> it needs seven electrons to complete its D before it even gets to four P, and then it needs six more. Right? So it can't be the name. How about bismuth? Bismuth is one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? Six S2, five D10, six P. And bismuth is one, two, three electrons over in the P's group. Right? So it needs three electrons to complete that P orbital. This is the answer. This one. All right, 62. Let's see. 66, I need to scroll some for that one. And let's see if I can. Oops, 66. No. How about if I do that? There we go. 66. Which of the following is the highest energy orbital for a silicon atom? The highest energy. So for this one, Silicon has 14, right? If we just write out the whole thing, we could use uh, abbreviated shorthand, but I'm gonna write the whole thing out. So we've got 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, that's 10, 12, we need two more. 3P2, 2, 4, 10, 12, 14. Okay, so that is the electronic configuration for neutral silicon. And the question says, which one has the highest energy orbital for a silicon atom? 3P2 is the highest energy for that one. 3P. That's why the answer is D. Okay. How about 67? Which of the following processes represents the ionization energy of bromine? Remember how to write the ionization energy equation. You start with a neutral atom in its gas state. It has to be in the gas state. Why? Because bromine at room temperature and pressure is a liquid. And if you start to heat it up, if you start to add the energy to it, most, the, all of the energy at first is gonna go into making a liquid into a gas. Has nothing to do with the electrons. So you're gonna think that you're putting energy into electrons, but you're not. So we want it in the gas state. Once we get it in the gas state, then we can, the energy we add is going to uh, eject electrons. So it needs to be a gas. Then we need to add energy, and we're going to end up with one positively charged gas ion plus the electron. That's the ionization energy equation for bromine. Eject one electron, leaves you with one positively charged cation. This is the first ionization energy. Right? So which one satisfies that one? Uh, 
there's a gas. And remember, um, normally bromine exists as Br2 liquid. So you're going to add enough energy to break the bonds between the two Br's, and then you're going to turn them into a gas. So there's a lot more energy in there than I originally um, proposed. All right, so here's the gas. One atom, uh, one mole of gas, one mole of the singly charged cation, and there's your electron. This is the correct equation for ionization energy of bromine. Sixty-seven. Let's see. Sixty-eight. Order the elements: sulfur, chlorine, and fluorine. In terms of increasing ionization energy, of increasing ionization energy, in that order. Okay. What's the trend in the periodic table? Ionization energy increases from lower left to upper right. So let's see, where are they located relative to one another? This is the most upper right you can get. So this is gonna be the highest ionization energy possible, fluorine, right? What's next? Well, if you go down one, you get the chlorine, right? Down is decreasing ionization energy. And then to the left of chlorine is sulfur. So it should be sulfur, chlorine, fluorine. In that order, increasing ionization energy. Let's see, that would be A. There you go. Uh, 69, looks like the same three elements. But this time we're looking for, in terms of increasing atomic radii. So how does the how does the atomic how does the atomic radii trend in the periodic table? From left to right it decreases, and from bottom to top it decreases. So from lower left to upper right, the radii decreases. So increasing would be upper right to lower left. So the smallest radii would be fluorine. The next would be sulfur. And the next would be chlorine. So it should be uh, fluorine, sulfur, chlorine. It should be, oops. Hold on a second. Why does that say fluorine, chlorine, sulfur? Oh, increasing atomic radii. Fluorine. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they're right. They're right. Fluorine, chlorine, sulfur. That's correct. We go down to increase for chlorine and then to the left to increase for sulfur. All right, 73. Let me scroll that and see if I can get two on there at once. There we go. 73. Of the following elements, which has the lowest first ionization energy? All right, so barium, calcium, silicon, phosphorus, and chlorine. The lowest first ionization energy. Remember, the lowest ionization energy is going to be in the lower left-hand corner, and the highest ionization energy will be the upper right. So let's see if any of those work. Chlorine's pretty close to the upper right. Phosphorus, silicon are lower than chlorine because they're to the left and below. Actually, but they're both to the 
They're both to the left, right? Uh, so if we keep going left and below, we get to calcium. And then we keep going down from calcium, we get to barium. Barium should have the lowest first ionization energy because of where it is in the periodic table. Lower left. How about of the following elements, which is the most likely to form negative ions with a charge? Oops, sorry. It's got the same list of elements? Yes. This is 74. Okay, which one is more likely to form a negative ion? The one that has the, the highest electronegativity, that is the one that has the highest energy required to eject an electron or the one that has the most negative electron affinity, okay. which means lower left to upper right, the strength of attraction for an electron increases. So the strongest attraction for electrons is fluorine. And very close to fluorine is fluorine. Here, fluorine. And compared to the rest of these, which are to the left and below, they would have a lesser attraction for uh, an electron. So this has to do with electron affinity. And electron infinite affinity becomes more negative as you move from lower left up right, which implies strength of attraction. The more negative is strength of attraction. All right, 70, 75. Which of the following atoms has the largest ionization energy? The largest first ionization energy. All right, let's take a look at them. Oxygen, lithium, neon, beryllium, and potassium. The upper right hand corner puts neon ahead of everybody else. The other consideration for ionization energy is the fact that this is a noble gas. It has complete electron uh, orbitals. There are no valence orbitals for noble gases. They're all core because they are complete. Plus, the position in the periodic table puts this to the upper right of everybody else. So that's why neon should have the very highest ionization, first ionization energy. Seventy-seven. Let's see. I better scroll this one. Okay, <clears throat> seventy-seven. Uh, we're backtracking a little bit. Which of these types of electromagnetic radiation arranged in order of decreasing frequency? Decreasing frequency means lower energy. So if you think of it in that terms, <clears throat> which one has the lowest energy to the right? <clears throat> uh, infrared has the lowest energy to the right. Well, let's see. Let's look at this one to see. If we uh, move to the left, there should be higher energy. Yes, visible. Ultraviolet, higher energy. C should be the answer. This is in correct order of decreasing frequency. Decreasing frequency means decreasing energy. If you look at the others, uh, gamma to microwave to visible, visible should be on the other side of microwave. Uh, microwave is the lowest energy in this group. Visible is the lowest energy in this group. 
radio wave is the lowest energy in this group, so it would have the lowest frequency. And uh, X-ray is the uh, highest frequency. So <laughs> this one is completely opposite order. If you flip it around, that would be acceptable, but not in this case. In this case, C is the only one that fits. <clears throat> 78 and let me see if I can get 79 on there also. Yeah. Okay. 78 and 79. So if I we're backtracking on some of these 78, which of these types of electromagnetic radiation are arranged in increasing wavelength? The longer the wavelength, the less energy. So for increasing wavelength, we want less energy. So which one's the most energetic? Most energetic should be on this side. X-ray is very energetic. But is it in the right order? X-ray, increasing wavelength, visible, ultraviolet, no. Ultraviolet should be on this side. So it can't be that one. Um, Ultraviolet is energetic, fairly, then visible, then infrared. This one is in the correct order of increasing wavelength, which means decreasing energy. 79, which has, which, which of these types, yeah, that's a typographical error. Oh, which one of these has these types of electromagnetic radiation order in decreasing energy? So now this one goes straight to energy. It doesn't talk about frequency. It doesn't talk about wavelength. We look at the most energetic and then down to the least energetic in order. The most energetic here is x-rays, but visible and ultraviolet are out of order. Ultraviolet, visible, infrared should be right. So. Actually, this is another way of saying that, right? 78 and 79 are exactly the same question with different wording. Okay, the next one, 80. In the quantum theory, the magnetic orbital momentum quantum number is most directly associated with which property of orbitals? Okay, so we have N, that's the principal quantum number. And what is it associated with? It's, it's associated with energy and size. Then we have L, which is sometimes we call it the azimuthal. <laughs> <clears throat> And, and also the uh, angular momentum. Momentum. Quantum number. This one is associated with uh, Shape. Took me a minute to Shape of the orbital. Then M sub L. This is the. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Well, that's as far as I need to go, right? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm on A. Uh, magnetic orbital. This is magnetic. Uh, magnetic uh, orbital momentum. This is orientation. Orientation in three-dimensional space. 
and then we got the spin. Okay, so for 80, the magnetic orbital is orientation, B. Okay, for 81, right, this is B. For 81, we're talking about angular orbital momentum here, and that is shape, D. Okay, so you would think of this one as either spherical or maybe dumbbell shaped. And then the orientation here would tell you that these dumbbells are either this way or this way or this way on the three different axes. That's the easiest one to visualize. A four and eighty five. A four. Select the correct electron configuration for copper. Okay. What do we need first? We need the uh, atomic number. Because that tells us how many electrons there are. So copper has 29. Okay. Now notice the answers are given in terms of the abbreviated shorthand. Okay. So if we follow copper and we go to our periodic table and we work backwards through the period until we get to the next available noble gas. It happens to be argon with 18. All right. So up to this point, argon is a core and it, it covers uh, 3P, up through 3P6, everything up through 3P6. So then we wrap around and we go to 4S. That was full. Then we go to 3D to work our way through the transition metals. And we will eventually come to copper. Copper is nine, is nine steps over. Ooh. All right. This is one that I hadn't shown you before. All right. This is an anomaly in the periodic table. We would expect it to be 3D9. The problem is, what is more stable? If we go this route, then we have right, a pair of electrons here, and D has one, two, three, four, five sublevels. And if we do nine, we go one, two, three, four, five, six seven eight nine all right it's just short of one electron being a full d orbital now which is the lower energy this one or if we take one from this principal quantum number four and put it in this principal quantum number three that is more stable so that means this one now has 10, it's complete. And this one is missing one. Okay. <clears throat> so this is one of the anomalies and this is the correct uh, energy, electronic configuration that's lowest energy for copper. All right, 85. Which of the following equations correctly represents the process involved in the electron affinity of X? So X is any element. So we start off with the neutral atom in the gas state. Electron affinity adds an electron to a neutral atom. 
So the electron has to be on this side of the equation. So what do you get over here? You get X with a negative charge still in the gas state. Okay. So that means this one right here is the correct expression for electron affinity. All right, looks like 86 coming up. There it is. Which of the following lists of atoms are arranged in order of decreasing atomic radius? Atomic radius. Decreasing. Okay, so what are the trends in the periodic table? Decreasing radius from lower left to upper right. The radius, the atomic radius decreases. That's a trend. So let's see. We got to look at each one. Lithium, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. Lithium, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. Let's see if we have any others. Lithium, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. Fluorine. Okay, then we get down to D, which has sodium, strontium, oxygen, and fluorine. And then the last one, calcium, cesium, sulfur, and selenium. Okay. Um, test taking technique. You have five unique answers. All right. So if you work your way down from the top or from the bottom up, it doesn't matter. Once you find the right answer, you're done. You don't have to think about any of the squirrely ones, like two of the above, none of the above, all of the above, whatever. So if we start with this group, since there are three of them, three selections, we can knock out A, B, C in one try. Right? Decreasing atomic radius. So if you look at your periodic table, decreasing from lower left to upper right, or decreasing from bottom to top and from left to right. So lithium is at the top. Anything below it? Oxygen, nitrogen, no. But oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, these are all in the same period, right? This is period uh, two, period two. So our trend is going to be decreasing radius from left to right. So left is here. Then next is nitrogen. And next is oxygen. And last is fluorine. Decreasing. Lithium, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Lithium, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. B is the answer right there. We don't even have to look at D or E. We found our answer. Let's see. Okay, yeah. 87 is next. It's a completely different problem. Consider an atom traveling at 1% of the speed of light. So its velocity of the atom is 1% of the speed of light, which is what? 1% 0 0.01 times 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's its velocity, which is equal to, this is 10 to the minus two, so it should be 2.9979 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. That's our velocity. The de Broglie wavelength found to be 1.46 times 10 to the minus three picometers. All right, but stay with me. We've got its velocity. 
We got its wavelength, but the wavelength is not in SI units. Picometer, what's a pico? A pico is a quadrillionth, whereas a nano is a billionth, 10 to the minus nine, a pico is 10 to the minus 12. So if we take this one, 10 to the minus 12 times that, that's 1.46 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay, what do we need to determine the, um, the element, right? We either need the atomic number or the mass. All right, so we're gonna need, I don't see any way we can find the atomic number from this, right? There's nothing in there that indicates protons or electrons. So what we're aiming for is the molar mass, right? This is all relative to a single atom. So if we can find the mass of a single atom, we can find its molar mass, all right? So what equations do we have that will give us information? Well, uh, mass, right? We have uh, Einstein's equation, equivalency, E equals mc squared. And we also have uh, energy in terms of um, Planck's equation, right? This is wavelength, so we're going to need this one divided by um, that one. Okay, here's the trick. This energy, this is based upon uh, photons. But now we're talking about real mass. So this velocity has to be substituted like that. I'm getting ahead of myself, excuse me. Let's leave it here for now. All right, <clears throat> so this is one atom. So if we can find the mass of that atom, we can calculate its molar mass. Right. So um, let's see, this is its velocity. I'm gonna write its velocity over here off camera so I can erase the board. Okay. And its wavelength is 1.46 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay. All right. Now let's use these two equations and derive one that gives us the answer in mass. Well, they're both equal to energy, right? So we can set these parts of the equation equal to one another. mc squared equals Planck's constant times c over lambda. Okay, now let's solve for mass. <clears throat> mass equals Planck's constant um, times c divided by wavelength times c squared. Right? c squared went over here. See, this is a numerator, numerator, denominator, denominator. So this cancels and leaves us with one of those, right? That's Planck's constant over wavelength times C. Okay, that's for light. We're talking about mass. So we have a different velocity for uh, this equation. Now we're gonna substitute in here instead of the speed of light. What is the speed of our atom? <clears throat> so that's equal to Planck's constant divided by wavelength times the actual velocity of the atom. Okay, that's mass. So we can solve this equation. All we need is Planck's constant. I have to look that one up because I don't remember. 
uh, 6.626 minus 34. Planck's constant. And the wavelength, which is 1.46 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, and also times the velocity, which is 2.9979 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. Okay. This is 1.5138 times 10 to the minus 35 kilograms. And that's for each atom. That's one atom. Okay. Now, <clears throat> since I'm limited on board space, I'm going to have to erase this stuff and make room. All right. So we've got, yeah, let me put this one up. 87. Let's take this value up here, 1.5. 138 times 10 to the minus 35 kilograms per atom. Now it becomes a dimensional analysis problem. You've got two dimensions that need to be converted. That needs to be in grams. This means to be in moles. So let's do the easiest one first. Kilograms, grams. 10 to the third, 1,000 grams per kilogram. Okay? Now let's do atoms. Atoms is on the bottom. We need atoms on the top and moles on the bottom. So what's the conversion factor there? Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. Atoms cancel. Now we got grams per mole. So we just need to finish that calculation, 1,000 times, and then 6.022 x point 23 times. Oops. What happened? Computer went to sleep. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, All right, what did I do wrong? Minus 35. Okay. Here, here, okay. So the minus 35 kilograms per atom, 1,000 grams per kilogram. Right? Okay. So that would be oh that's not right. And do this calculation again. 6.626 exponent. And then 1.46 exponent. And then 2.9979. X six. Oh, 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 oh.
That's 15. Right? So this needs to be 2. There we go. So now this is minus 2. <coughs> There we go, 91.2 grams per mole. So which one comes close to that? We look at our periodic table, 91.2. And follow it along, I think we're on zirconium. There we go. That was a tough one. That looks like extra credit problem time. Eighty-seven. Uh, eighty-eight. Scrolling. Okay, this is going to be a logical problem. There's not really a calculation involved in this one. In an investigation of the electronic absorption spectrum of a particular element, it is found that a photon having wavelength 500 nanometers right, from which we can find the energy of transition between levels of the electron provides just enough energy to promote an electron from the second quantum level to the third. That's just enough energy. Right, so it's coming in like this. Oops, right, H. Just enough energy to promote that electron from two to, to three. From this information, we can deduce what? The energy of the N equals two level. And to emphasize, that's the only information you have. Right? From that information, what can we say? We don't know what the n equals two level is, or the n equals three level is. We don't know because the energy is the difference. That's the change in energy that's related to this value. And that is equal to, well, let's see, it would be, now we can say something about it but it's the change in energy. The sum of the energies of N2 and N3? No, you don't sum them up. The difference in energies between N2 and N3? Yes, this is the difference in energy. That's what we can deduce from that information alone. So the answer is D. All right. Uh, 89. Let's see if I can scroll this one just a little bit. Oh, we're going to have two. So let me do, let's do 89 first. And then we'll take a look at 90. So this information tells us 
Now, this information actually gives you the energy value for each of the levels. And notice that the closer you get to the nucleus, the more negative the number. And like I said before, if you consider the atom as the system, then as the electron drops into lower and lower orbitals, it gets less and less energy, so it has to give up energy. That means its actual energy level is negative. Okay, with those values, in the hydrogen spectrum, what's the wavelength of light associated with N? Oops. Uh, hold on a second. There we go. <clears throat> what's the wavelength of light associated with N equals 3 to N equals 1 electron transition? So if we go to 3, N3 to N1, what is the energy associated with that? Okay. Well, we know that, and, and we don't have to use um, the um, Planck's equation because we have the actual values of energy for each level. So we need to know, first we need to know the amount of energy, then we can use Planck's equation, which is what? H equals C divided by wavelength. We need to know this value first. So if we're going from N equals three to N equals one, then the, the uh, the final energy is minus 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. It's final minus initial. And the initial is 3 minus 0 0.2420 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So that's delta E. So what is that? Well, they're both here. They're both the same power, so it's, it's got to be something times 10 to the minus 18. So we just need to look at these two. That's a positive now. Negative times a negative is a positive. So if we add uh, 0 0.242 and the 0 drops off the end, then that's 6, 3, 2 from 11 is 9, 1 1.9, minus 1.936. Now, this equation is not, not going to take kindly to a negative number. So all we need to know is what is the transition of the energy? It's this value, right? The absolute value is the one we want. So we need Planck's uh, constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, right? times the speed of light, and I'm just going to write C. Uh, I guess I better, hold on a second. Uh, let's move this over. Delta E equals Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And then up here, we need speed of light, uh, 2.9979 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And then down here, we need the wavelength. Oh, which is the question. <laughs> and the energy over here is this value right here. Like I said, we're going to drop that sign. That goes right here. So now to find the wavelength, we take this denominator, put it over here, numerator, and take this numerator, put it over here, denominator. So it's this value times that value divided by this value. So 6.626 exponent negative 34, 2.9979 exponent 8 times, and then divided by this number, 1.936 exponent 18, negative 18 and divide. 
Uh, so we get um, the wavelength is equal to 1.026 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. All right. So that's why this one is the, is the closest one. 1.03 times 10 to the minus 7 meters is the wavelength of that light. Okay. Um, what's the wavelength of light that is emitted when an excited electron in the hydrogen atom falls from N5 to N1? Right? It's the same approach. But now we're going from 5 to 1. Right? So from 5 to 1, and I'll scroll for the answers in a minute. If we go from 5 to 1, then uh, we need to go from, uh, this one is 1, we need 5 here. 08712, 08712, so let me put that one in, 2.178 and 0.08712, and that's 2.0909. Two point oh nine oh nine times ten to the minus eighteen. This one would go in here. So now we want this value times that value divided by this value, just like we did before. Six point six two six exponent thirty. Two point nine nine seven nine exponent eight times, and then. Divide by that with 2.0909 exponent negative 18. So I get this is 10 to the minus 7. Our new wavelength is 10 to the minus 8. 9.50 times 10 to the minus 8. So let me scroll. And there it is, right there. So we made a bigger jump from five to one. So the wavelength should be shorter, higher energy. And it is. Okay, let's see where we're at. 91. Which of the following is a reasonable criticism of the Bohr model of the atom? Okay, remember the Bohr model? It says there's a nucleus here, kind of like the sun. And then there are electrons out here orbiting like the planets. Okay, that's the Bohr model. And each one of these levels. has a number associated with it, which we now use as the principal quantum number. And electrons can only occupy positions equivalent to this energy level, that energy level, that energy level on in whole number increments. And these are quantized positions, nothing in between. It's not continuous, it's quantized. Okay, now let's look at our possibilities. It makes no attempt to explain why a negative electron does not eventually fall into the positive nucleus. That's not a reasonable criticism because that's what it does. It makes no attempt to explain why the electrons don't fall into the nucleus, <laughs> right? So that's a reasonable one. Uh, well, it's, a, it's not a reasonable criticism, it's a reasonable fact, right? So we're not criticizing Bohr for this one because he made no claims there. It does not adequately predict the line spectrum of hydrogen. Oh yes, it does. We can't criticize it for that. It does that very well. C, it does not adequately predict the ionization energy of the valence electrons for elements other than hydrogen. That's true. It can estimate, but it does not 
predict accurately the energies of any um, non-hydrogen atoms? Oh, we found our answer. It's C. All right, 93. We have to scroll this one. All right. Which of the following statements is or are true? Notice, I always check the answers in a multiple choice. Notice that we've got multiples, either threes or twos. So we know that at least two are uh, valid statements. They're true statements. Uh, 93. Okay. An excited atom. This is Roman numeral one. An excited atom can return to its ground state by absorbing electromagnetic radiation. Is that true? No. When an atom returns to its ground state from any level, it has to give up energy. It's getting closer to the nucleus, which is a lower energy state. Right? So it has to give up energy. So Roman numeral one is false. How about two? The energy of an atom is increased when electromagnetic radiation is emitted from it. Now, that's another way of saying Roman numeral one. It's just the opposite of what actually happens. Uh, the energy of the atom is decreased when radiation is emitted. So two is false. How about three? The energy of electromagnetic radiation increases as its frequency increases. Yes. Based upon Planck's equation. If frequency increases, energy increases. An electron in the N equals four state in a hydrogen atom can go to the N equals two state. N equals four to N equals two, okay, by emitting electromagnetic radiation at the appropriate frequency. So when it does that, yes, that's true. As it drops from a higher energy level to a lower, it has to give up energy. That one is also true. True, true. How about this one? Five, the frequency and wavelength of electromagnetic radiation are inversely proportional to each other. Well, how are they related? Wavelength times frequency is equal to what? Speed of light, a constant. So whenever you get a product of two variables equal to a constant, they are inversely proportional to one another. In other words, if this one goes up, that one has to go down to keep this one constant. That one is also true. So the answer is three, four, and five right here. All right, not quite, uh, 94, oh, okay. Let me see if I can scroll just a little bit. And there we go, 94. Consider the following representation of a 2P orbital. This is a representation of a 2p orbital. Okay. Which of the following statements best describes the movement of electrons in a p orbital? Electron movement is what we're after. The electrons move along the outer surface of the p orbital similar to a figure A. A is false. Those orbitals say nothing about the movement of electrons. What are they? The, phys the uh, artist's representation of an orbital simply is a, an expression of probability. 
that's where you would most likely find the electron around the atom. And this is the nucleus right here. Okay. There's always a node at the nucleus. Okay, B. The electrons move within the two lobes of P orbital, but never beyond the outside surface of the orbital. No, um, they can move outside that. This is just the highest probability of finding an electron in that region. Right? We're still talking probabilities. So when the electrons move, they can be outside that, that region. It's just unlikely. C, the electrons are concentrated at the center, the node of the two lobes. No, that's just the opposite. Nodes mean the probability of finding an electron in a node, as drawn here, is zero. How about D? The electrons are only moving in one lobe at any given time. Sorry. <laughs> it just says that that's where you find them. They could be on one side, on the other side. They could be on both sides at the same time. E. The electron movement cannot be exactly determined. That is true. You can't say that the electron moves from here to here and back again with any degree of certainty. So E is true. Ninety-five. All right. How many electrons can be contained in all of the orbitals with n equals four? All right, n equals four. So the next one is L, right? It can be zero, one, two, or three. M sub L. How many M sub Ls? From this one, you can all have that one. From this one, you can have minus one, zero, plus one. From this one, you can have minus two, plus uh, C. Excuse me. Minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And from this one, you can have plus, you can have, uh, wrong direction. Minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. Okay? Now, the question is how many electrons can be contained in all of the orbitals of n equals four? Each one of these orbitals can contain two electrons, plus one half or minus one half. Right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 times two equals 32 electrons. There's your answer right there. 32 electrons total in N equals four. Let's see, before I erase that, let's scroll, see what's coming up. Ninety-six. The small but important energy differences between 3s, 3p, and 3d. Okay, are due mainly to what? These are not, these are general energy equivalents. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier, we ran across this term, degenerate. Orbitals. Okay. In chemistry, degenerate means same energy. If they're degenerate, uh, they're not perverted, right? <laughs> if they're degenerate, they have the same energy. So any orbitals 
that have the same energy level are degenerate. So that means the 3p orbitals, those would be, would be degenerate orbitals. They're all the same energy level. The d's would have five, five degenerate orbitals. Okay. S would only have one, so degenerate doesn't mean anything. But these orbitals are at a different energy level than this orbital, and they're a different energy than this orbital. And they're slightly above. This one is a little higher, and this one's a little higher than that one. Okay, why is that? Uh, small but important energy difference between these orbitals are due mainly to what? The number of electrons they hold? No. Their principal quantum number? That can't be it because they're all the same. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle? No. That doesn't speak to energy, it speaks to position and velocity or momentum. Hun's rule, Hun's rule just says what order you put them in. It right? doesn't say anything about energy. How about the penetration effect? Ah, the penetration effect says that this one, uh, three, S is going to be like, uh, well, maybe like this. And then the P is going to be, the three P is going to have two nodes on it, I think. Yeah, I believe it's two nodes. So it's going to be like this. Um, no, the three S is not, oh, I'm sorry. Three S is not like that. 3s is going to be like this, like this, and like this. Right, zero down to zero nodes. Okay, then the 3p is going to have um, much of its energy in this region here, like that. And then the 3d is going to have much of its energy, uh, like. I can't even think of it. But it's what we're looking at is the penetration effect. The difference in energy is the fact that the s orbital penetrates deeper toward the nucleus than the p does. And the d and it, p penetrates deeper than the d orbital. So the penetration effect says that the energy level is determined by their probabilities and how they're distributed versus energy. So this one has carries uh, electron probabilities closer to the nucleus than this one does, and this one closer than that one does. So the penetration effect explains that slight difference in energy that you would, ex you would expect them to be equal at 3s, at 3, 3, and 3, but they're slightly different because of their different uh, penetration effects. Okay. Ninety seven. Which of the following was not an elemental property usually predicted by Mendeleev or undiscovered elements? Right. How about electron configuration? Yep. <laughs> Mendeleev knew absolutely nothing about electron configuration that hadn't been invented yet. So we can stop there. He did talk about atomic mass, about density, boiling points, oxide formulas. Oh, yeah. That was very common and popular in those days. The only one he had no information about was electron configuration. All right, 98. We ought to be getting close to the end. Which of the following atoms or ions has three unpaired electrons? Right. So we have uh, nitrogen, oxygen, aluminum, uh, sulfur 2 minus, and titanium 2 plus. Three unpaired electrons. Okay, notice. 
that we've got unique selections for all five. So if we start at the top, work our way down, and find the right answer, we can stop. So what's the electron configuration of nitrogen? Well, let's see, nitrogen has seven. So 1s2, 2s2, that's four, we need three more. 2p3, one, two, three. Three unpaired electrons, there's your answer. All righty, 101. And element E has the electron configuration of uh, krypton. Let's write krypton's number in here just in case, 36. Okay, uh, 5s2, 4d10, and 5p2. The formula for the fluoride of, of E is what? So we're going to have E and F, right? What's the charge on F? F is always minus 1. So what would be the charge of E? Well, most likely, it would give up its valence electrons. These two and those two. So this would be four plus. That means it would be E, F, four. What's another possibility? It could give up these two higher ones, and that would be E, two plus, and F one minus, which would be E F two. That's a possibility, <clears throat> but that's not a selection, right? So this is the best one for that group, E F four. All right, one oh one, one oh four. Gotta scroll. There we go. 104. Which of the following atoms would have the largest second ionization energy? Okay. Magnesium, chlorine, sulfur, calcium, and sodium. Okay. Second ionization ace. Second ionization energy really jumps up when the second electron you remove comes from the core. So let's look for one that has the core electron after the first one is lost. Magnesium, what are its valences? Magnesium is 3s2. So the second electron would be uh, require more energy but we're not in the core yet. How about chlorine? Chlorine's got uh, 3P7. Right? You're definitely not in the core there. You got seven electrons before you get down to the core. How about sulfur? Sulfur is 3P4. Nope. You haven't got into the core yet there. How about calcium? Calcium is 4s2. Right. No, second electron is still valence. How about sodium? Sodium is 3s1. Uh -huh. First ionization energy gets rid of that one. Now you're into the core. So what's the core? The core is 2p6. Right. So sodium would definitely have the highest second ionization energy because you're into the core now. All right, let's see. My goodness, we're still rolling. Yeah, we can get these two, 107. 
Which of the following concerning second ionization energies is true? Well, it looks like, let's look at the questions. They're looking at aluminum and magnesium. Aluminum and magnesium, aluminum and magnesium. Okay, so we need to know something about those two. Aluminum and magnesium. So aluminum is 13, magnesium is 12, okay? So this is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that's 10. Wait a minute, 1s2, 2s2. Yes, uh, 3s2 and 3p, one, so that's 10 plus three is 13, there we go. Magnesium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 2, 4, 10, 12, okay. <clears throat> so, concerning the second ionization energy, okay, for aluminum, we've got three valence electrons. For magnesium, we have two valence electrons. So the uh, second ionization energy for both of them will be extracting an electron from a valence shell. We're not into the core yet. So the first ionization energy should be higher for aluminum. So the second ionization energy, possibly a little higher, but they're comparable. Let's see what statements we have. Uh, aluminum is higher than magnesium because magnesium wants to lose the second electron, so it's easier to make. No. Aluminum is higher than that of magnesium because the electrons are taken away from the same energy level, but aluminum atom has one more proton. Uh, that's a good candidate. Uh, if we look at the bottom first, the second ionization energies are not equal. Why? Because besides the fact that they're coming from the same orbitals, aluminum has one more proton, which makes the, the second ionization energy as well as the first higher than it is for magnesium. So E cannot be true. Uh, A can't be true. We already dismissed that one. Aluminum is higher than that of magnesium because electrons are taken from the same energy level, but aluminum has one more proton. That's a good answer. Right? That's a very good answer. Aluminum is not lower. Aluminum is not lower because it is to the right of magnesium. So the trend even holds... Uh, roughly, for a second ionization energies also, as long as the electrons are coming from uh, valence shells, right? If they come from the core, then all bets are off. You, you can't, there's no trend there. It's just the, it's just massively more energy from the core. But as long as you're coming from the same energy level, then you can say something about their trends relative to the number of protons. And that's why B is a better answer than any of the others. One oh eight. All right, what do we have here? Consider a planet, uh-oh, where the temperature is so high that the ground state of an electron in the hydrogen atom is N equals four. What's the ratio of ionization energy for hydrogen on this planet compared to that on Earth? Well, let's think about it logically first. If on Earth, the uh, ground state electron is one, and on the other planet, the ground state is four, okay? <clears throat> which one's going to take more energy to remove the electron? 
the ratio of ionization energy of hydrogen on this planet compared to that of Earth. So we want ionization energy oops, backwards. What we're looking for is the ratio ionization energy for the planet divided by ionization energy for Earth. Okay, so should this number be greater than one or less than one? It's going to take less energy to remove that electron on the planet than it does on Earth, right? Because it's already up to level four. So a little bit more energy is, will be required, but a lot of energy from ground state one. So this one should be less than one, some ratio less than one. That means that it's either this one or this one. It can't be that one, it can't be that one, and they're not gonna be the same. Right? So we've eliminated them all down to A at one to four, or B, uh, excuse me, C, one to 16. So if you're in a hurry, you can take a guess, right? 50-50 uh, chance. But if you're actually gonna calculate it, Let's see, 108. All right, so okay. If we're looking at the ratio of energies. Uh, we want to be able to calculate the energy for one versus the other. So what is it going to be? What's the, the energy required to go from here to there? Well, for either one, it's a difference from uh, one to infinity or four to infinity. Okay, now what's the expression for those energies? It's uh, minus 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18th, minus 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18th times the final minus the initial. Okay, and the final is one squared for hydrogen, right? That's the Z number. And this is the uh, energy level as infinity. And then minus that same number times 10 to the minus 18. And this is one squared over now this one is actually if this is for energy transition for earth this would be one okay yeah if this were for the earth if this is for the other planet It would be the same, right? We're still going to infinity, but we're coming from um, this value here times, and it's the same Z number, right? But this one is level four squared, okay? All right. Uh, let's see if I did that right. Yeah. Okay, so what's the ratio here? The ratio is this one 
divided by this one. So notice that this value here goes to zero. That's zero, that's zero because of this infinity. So we're really looking at this one divided by that one. All right, so I'm gonna have to erase some of this. Uh, okay. Now this one's gonna be this value right here. Um, I'm just gonna call this, uh, I'm gonna call it K for constant because it's the same on both of them. And then we have uh, one squared over one divided by one squared over four squared. There we go. Okay, so the k's cancel, right? These values. This is equal to one. And this is equal to um, one divided by 16. You know, what's wrong with this picture? If we do that calculation, Okay. That would put that puts it in the wrong ratio. Because this flips into the numerator, 16 to 1, 16 planted over one Earth. That's not right, because we know it takes more energy for Earth than it does for. So I got something turned around here. This is a negative, this is a negative. That's positive, positive now. Okay. Let me see if I read it right. What's the ratio of ionization energy for hydrogen on this planet compared to that on Earth? Ionization energy on this planet compared to that on Earth. Yeah, it should take less energy. 116. 1 16th as much energy. So this, this ionization energy is 1 16th that uh, Earth. All right, we're done with this review. Exams on Thursday. Exam only, no new material on Thursday.